is one of our listeners sent in a statement. She's a peach to describe someone that's actually being a beach. And some words were edited for radio. That is B-E-A-C-H, just to be clear. <laughs> All right. Lucian Smith, we've got you in studio. I'm very excited for you to be here. You're actually my first in-person oh, wow. uh, interview since I've been in the guest host role. So thank you so much. Can't Absolutely. Think of, I'm honored. I can't think of a better person to, uh, to, to talk to and catch up with. All right. Well, thank you for being here. Um, every, I think the majority of our listeners know you are the former chairman of Mississippi GOP and regularly provide insight um, to the Super Talk station on the state of political affairs. I think something that would be really interesting to go through is just looking back at the year. Um, there's been a lot of major stories, some that received initial media attention and then fizzled out one way or the other. But, um, you know, I, I think we could get into themes. But when you think about this past year, what is a news story? Um, what What is one of the biggest news stories that just comes to mind? I mean, I, I think the and this is more thematic than a specific story, mm-hmm. but but the the discord between the way Joe Biden ran uh, for president the way he he asserted that he would be as president and then the way he turned around and governed uh, Mm -hmm. that you know he he, the pitch in uh, in 2020 was that he was going to be this kind of moderate boring make the trains run on time president not you know the the way he termed it was that he was going to be a transitional president not Mm -hmm. a transformational president and then he turns around uh, and tries to govern, uh, you know, with his models being uh, LBJ and FDR, uh, both of whom had massive mandates uh, and both of whom were uh, dealing with actual crises that needed uh, some of the legislation that they uh, they passed. I don't necessarily agree with everything that they did, but, you know, Biden had no mandate for that. I mean, he, he yeah. didn't come in having some, A, he didn't come in with some sort of overwhelming uh, victory having run on uh, a, a, a platform that was far left. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't have strong control in either legislature. I mean, when LBJ uh, passed the Great Society legislation, there were overwhelming Democratic majorities that supported him in doing it. I mean, here you've got razor thin majorities, uh, and he's been trying to ram through this this far left agenda. And to me, that's sort of the the one of the dominant political stories of twenty one. And I think it's going to resonate in a big way in twenty two as we look at the midterm elections. Yeah, I think you're right, and it it was so stark. Uh, in my opinion, coming after President Trump, who um, really was, he wasn't your normal politician, where you were sold a bill of goods on the campaign trail, then when you got to Washington, D.C., you governed differently. And as you rightfully point out, that is unfortunately what we've seen with Joe Biden. And, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that He's not really calling the shots. It's uh, it's it's the staff around him. I think that's right. And uh, and and some of the cabinet officials that he's put in place that are really just an extension of the Obama administration. That's right. That's right. And I, and I think you're exactly right. I mean, he he is, from what I can tell, and he makes public statements that sort of confirm this. He's very much. Um, He's sort of a figurehead, right? I mean, he, he is – it's like he's the Queen of England and people come in and hand him papers that he's supposed to read. And, and you, you've you seen him repeatedly at, at press conferences say things like, I'm not supposed to take questions or they told me not to take questions today. You're the president of the United States. You, you can literally not launch nuclear weapons with no one else's permission. Nobody gets to say, Mr. President, you can't take questions. Um, but it's clear that he's just sort of getting walked around by handlers. And I think you're right. I think they're, for the most part, young leftist ideologues, and mm-hmm. they're governing in the way that they would want to. But none of them could have ever gotten elected on the sort of platform that they want to see happen. Uh, and, and I think that is a big part of the, of the leftward tilt that you've seen from him. Yeah, and the reality that you have a 50-50 split, uh, split in the Senate. Exactly. And you, you have people like Joe Manchin um, and Kristen Cinema and members of their own party that are willing to stand up and say, hey, my, my name is on the door. My name's on this ticket. I can't I can't buy into this extreme agenda that, right. that, that you're trying to um, push on the American people. At large. Somebody, um, somebody else made this point, but I, th- I think it's a really good one. I, it, the the the, the left, especially during COVID, but I think it's it's gone before then, has gotten so used to being able to bully people into things mm-hmm. uh, and do things by edict. You know, all these COVID mandates that you know didn't go through proper legal channels to be put in place. They were just sort of ordered. The cancel culture where if you don't say or think the right thing, uh, suddenly they send the mob on you. And so people are so afraid to, to diverge from, uh, from the, the standard dogma. 
And I, I think I think they sort of thought they could do the same thing with Kristen Cinema and Joe Manchin that you know you could come in and say, well, you're evil if you don't do this. Have a bunch of people on Twitter uh, harass them, and suddenly uh, they would change their views. And, and I, it's they're uh, you know it's amazing. I'm glad I'm very glad Joe Manchin is there uh, yeah. because he, he, in a lot of ways, he's one of the few things that's keeping uh, the, the worst parts of the Democratic agenda from making it through. I think you're absolutely right. Okay, looking back at the year, um, what would you put out there as some of the biggest economic news that we all dealt with? I mean, I think it is tough to uh, inflation. I think is probably the the biggest economic story. I heard the crypto uh, conversation earlier, and that's I think that's a very interesting financial story. Um, but inflation. I mean, most of us, you know, if you're our age, you really have not lived in a time of significant inflation. Um, and inflation, as you know, is is about the best way to tax the middle class. I mean, yeah. it is a tax almost exclusively on the middle part of the the income spectrum because you know if you're not to pick on members of congress but if you're a member of congress making one hundred eighty six thousand dollars a year if a gallon of milk starts costing eight dollars you're still going to buy milk if you want milk that's you know, right. it's not going to negatively affect you in, in in the same way it would if, if you were making forty or fifty thousand dollars a year and the other piece of it is the the wealthier you get, the more of your wealth is going to be held in assets whose value will continue to increase during an inflationary period even more than inflation. So if you're making $200,000 a year, chances are most of your wealth is in stocks. You know, Maybe you've got some uh, a, a rental property somewhere uh, that you're making some money off of. Uh, those are going to just get more valuable yeah. during an inflationary period. Whereas if most of your money is held in a savings account, that is literally 6% less valuable than it was the, the year before. It would be like if you had, uh, and I'm going to use uh, round numbers because I'm not great with math. But me if you, neither. If you had I went to law. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> if you had $100,000 in your bank account, it would be like you just opened it up a year later and you had $94,000 in your bank account. And so uh, it is it is a very precise middle-class tax, uh, and it's coming in large part from the policies that, that have come out of the Biden administration. I, I know there is hope um, – that that it's going to be a temporary uh, thing, but I, I, I'm I'm uh, I'm worried it's something we're going to keep on saying uh, well into to 22 and possibly beyond, and that's going to that's going to really hurt people uh, in a lot of ways. Yeah, I agree, and um and and deter the people the, the ability of people to invest and expand from a business perspective. Those small to mid sized businesses are equally impacted in the same way that the middle class is. And look, the start of this year, the administration started off by flooding. Um, we're talking about trillions of dollars now, trillions of dollars into the economy um, when we had not yet had an opportunity to recover from the shutdown and the impact of COVID. That's right. And so just totally irresponsible. All well, right. And some of these, I'll say this, Mandy, uh -huh. also, some of these huge interventions mm -hmm. um, from the federal government, you know, I, I generally am against them. Mm -hmm. But you certainly don't need them uh, when we have a labor shortage. I mean, you're saying we've got to have these massive federal spending programs because uh, people can't find work. Well, work, uh, companies can't find people to work. I mean, that's the, the worst time for there to be this massive infusion of uh, federal money that we can't afford to begin with. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And they should be encouraging people to uh, have easier access to, to the workforce instead of just pushing them out that much further. That's right. Okay. Biggest political upset this year, what would you say? No doubt it's the Virginia race. Yeah. Um, I mean, that that was... We've been told for years that Virginia's, you know, certainly purple, maybe trending blue. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that Glenn Youngkin won is a huge success. And, and it's a it's a testament. It's a perfect example of what you see going on with a well-run Republican campaign and the typical sort of Democratic talking points. I mean, all you are going to hear about for the next year from the Democrats is Trump, 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 Trump. Yeah. That is the only thing they want to talk about. And there was a, a great video that I'm sure you've seen. Uh, where they uh, they took the Democratic nominee, and it was him over and over again saying Trump. And I think it's a hundred different times at a hundred different events, him saying Trump, because the Democratic polling has shown that in certain more moderate areas, like big swaths of Virginia, mm -hmm. Donald Trump doesn't poll well. So if you can connect Donald Trump to the Republican candidate, hopefully you turn some of those people off. Uh, but Yunkin ran on issues. He ran on important issues. He ran on issues that mattered uh, to regular voters uh, and not on personality. And, and when we run on policy, Republicans tend to win. You're absolutely right. And, and policies that are really embolden parents to be involved in their education. That's right. Um, something that really goes across both 
both aisles, Republican and Democrat. That's exactly right. All right. So we are going to take a break and have you stick around a little bit more. Uh, We'll talk a little bit more about big stories of the year and what to expect in Mississippi in 2022. This is Mandy Gunasegra, guest hosting on Middays uh, on Super Talk Mississippi. We'll see you after the break. And we're talking with Lucian Smith. Uh, we were just going through some of the the bigger stories that really define 2021 on a national level. Um, you know, before we move into some of the issues that are particular to Mississippi and Mississippi legislative focused, um, here, here's one other question. What do you think is the biggest political theater story of the year? I think it's probably the committee that Pelosi uh, set up to ostensibly investigate what happened on January 6th. And, I, you know, from the get go. And let me be clear. What happened on January 6th was terrible. Yeah. Uh, the people who were involved need to be prosecuted. But we have investigative agencies in this country who are investigating, who did investigate. Yep. They have prosecuted a not insignificant number of the people uh, who were involved on the uh on the riot that day, and they should. And people ought to go to jail for a very long time for for doing what they did. The point of this committee, though, it has nothing to do with finding facts. It has everything to do with making sure that Donald Trump and the January 6th riots are constantly in the news. And the mainstream media is going to oblige over and over and over again for one reason, exactly what we were talking about in the Glenn Youngkin uh, race in Virginia. Mm -hmm. They think if they can make the 22 election about Donald Trump uh, that they have a chance of holding on to the House and maybe holding on to the Senate. And so it is going to be Trump, 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 uh, you know, this insurrection, attempted coup stuff that there's ju- there's no I mean, look, it was a horrible day. And there yeah. were a lot of people on our side who, who uh, hold a lot of blame for it. And I've been very public about that. But the idea that it was some sort of attempted coup, there's no evidence for it. But mm-hmm. you're going to keep hearing that. Uh, because uh, they think that that will help the Democrats in the 22 midterm election. And that's the sole purpose of that committee. And there are lots of, you know, I'd love to know, I'd love to see the committee investigate uh, why Speaker Pelosi was part of a group, as I understand it, that prevented the Capitol Police from having more people ready that day or from bringing in additional uh, support from the National Guard in advance. I mean, that's a question that would be worth investigating, but it's not what this committee is going to be focused on. It's going to be committed. It's going to be focused on generating headlines about Donald Trump so they can be used for political purposes in the midterm elections. Aimed at harming Republicans and and those quote unquote Trump voters and Trump right. people, they always reference. It's interesting the term insurrection. Um, it's 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 becoming common parlance yes. uh, among Democrats, and you're exactly right. They're using it for political purposes. If it was serious, you know, one thing I haven't seen any information about that I actually personally care about because I was there. Um, I was there with my kids in my home, which is a less than a quarter mile from the Capitol, probably about two football fields. Was um, the bomber? Remember there was a bomb. Um, um, by right the, the Republican, before. yeah, RNC, and then by the DNC. My house was right in the middle. Um, I had federal agents in my backyard. I've talked to the FBI twice about getting some of the footage I have. We haven't heard any information about that type of information, which that and Pelosi's decision to forego additional help when they knew how many people were actually right. coming in. Um, it's just it's it's not a serious use. It's not a serious endeavor. And I would argue it is a misuse of resources and authority um, uh, up there on Capitol Hill. Yeah, it's a purely political. Uh, it's it, it, to your point, it's political theater. Yeah. OK, let's focus a little bit on Mississippi. I've already had uh, one of our listeners on the text line, C Spire text line, that has asked if we have any major predictions for what's going to happen in 2022. Um, now, some of these are stories. Some of these are stories from this year, but they will roll over into next year's action, uh, legislative action. I feel like at the top of the list is probably the discussion on income tax. What do you think is going to happen? Are, are we going to repeal that? Will folks find a way to repeal that in the state? I, I hope that we do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I think it's a good idea to get rid of the the income tax. Uh, the the governor is supportive of it. The speaker has a, a a bill to do it, and he's very supportive of it. Um, you know, the question is how you pay for it. Mm-hmm. Um, that that I think is the biggest sticking point because the the income tax provides a massive. Uh, amount of revenue to the state. And so if you just 
if you just passed a bill, and no one's suggesting this, but if you just passed a bill next year that said we, Mississippi has no income tax, um, that would result in pretty cataclysmic uh, revenue problems for putting the budget together. Now, there, there may be some people who'd be happy to see that happen, but it's, it's enough of a percentage um, of the state general fund budget that you'd have to see a massive reduction in services. You'd see fewer troopers on the road. You'd see, uh, you know, child support centers having to shut down to cut uh, cut money back. So, the question is how you do it. And the the, the speaker has proposed um, a, a increase in uh, sales tax, but the increase is, is limited to certain areas of of sales tax. So Got you, it. you wouldn't see. Your utility bill wouldn't get more expensive. Your groceries wouldn't get more expensive. And and the way the the speaker puts it is that it's essentially sales tax on pure consumables. And so the average Mississippian under his proposal, as I understand it, would get thirteen hundred uh, thirteen hundred dollar reduction in their income tax. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you would have to spend somewhere around fifty thousand dollars a year on things that are subject to the new sales tax in order uh, you'd have to spend at least fifty three thousand dollars before your it wouldn't net out and so he's brought in uh, for most but the point being for most people it would be a net reduction in the total taxes that they uh, they would pay and he's had it looked at by Grover Norquist, uh, who runs Americans for mm-hmm. Tax Reform, very, uh, very conservative, uh, very fiscally conservative, especially on tax issues and Norquist, as I understand, has endorsed it. But I think the, the big question is you have, a, you have one group uh, who is opposed to the speaker's plan specifically because it's a sales tax increase. So yeah. there's, there's a concern for, you know, if you're, a, say, a retiree uh, who, who doesn't really have any income tax liability, if you see your sales tax sales taxes go up, well, that's not really going to be a, be a cut to you. And I think what the speaker would say is, uh, because the, his bill doesn't increase sales tax on so many of the, you know, your, your prescription drugs, your groceries, et cetera, that you really aren't going to be affected by it. And so I think that's going to be a big debate. I think there are also some people, uh, you know, who are more moderate, who uh, don't want the state to give up that revenue. They'd rather, uh, they'd rather spend it. And ideologically, uh, I'm just not one of them. I mean, I, I think people are better off. People know how to spend their money better than the government does, yeah. period. So I think if we can get rid of the income tax, that'd be a good thing. Well, and it would make Mississippi extremely competitive. If you look at some of our neighboring states, um, they've they've gotten rid of their income tax provisions, and it has benefited significant growth and job opportunities, which in my mind can also level out some of the issues that are coming up in the how do we pay for this and maintain necessary revenues. Um, and I would agree with you, uh, not be of this position to where you're constantly trying to get more revenues to grow the size and scope of the state government. That's right. And more people coming is, is, is one of the best ways we can grow the economy is let's have more people coming here, spending money, living here, building businesses. And if, if not having an income tax causes them to want to be here, that's a good reason to do it. Yeah, I agree. Look, I was one of these people that I had left 10 years in D.C. I wanted to come back to Mississippi. I didn't really know how to make it happen. I know there's a lot of people out there that I talk to from Mississippi. Folks want to live here. And if we can do things to make it that much more enticing to come back home other than be in home, right. um, which has significant benefit, but make people's lives and ability to grow and develop businesses and ideas that much easier. I just think that's that's a win-win all around. Uh, absolutely. Well, it certainly be the source of interesting debate next year. Okay, another hot topic is uh, medical marijuana. This seems like something that um, there there is a uh, the, the voters have spoken, and now it's just a matter of figuring out how to make it happen and when that actually comes through. Um, what, what's your perspective on that? I, I'm very confident that we're going to have a medical marijuana program um, at some point in 22. Um, I, I think, to your point, the people have, have spoken very clearly. I think the legis- a lot of legislators who never would have imagined voting for a medical marijuana bill, you know, now they've seen huge turnout in their district in support of it, and they're going to they're gonna vote what the people voted for. The biggest question is timing. Yeah. Um, you know, there was... A lot of us, myself included, thought there would be a special session over the summer after the Supreme Court decision. Um, and the House and Senate, they eventually reached an agreement. And as I understand it, that they still have a policy issue having to do with the um, the, the volume of marijuana that a person can buy uh, in a single period. Uh, and that's sort of a conflict with the governor. And so I think the yeah. biggest question is going to be, does the legislature, as some people have suggested, move this quickly in January? Do they come in, pass a bill, and be done with it? Uh, or do they continue to try to negotiate in session uh, with the governor? And, and 
I, you know, my guess is they're going to move quickly on it. I mm-hmm. think most of them, you know, keep in mind, 22 is the last legislative session before you move into an election year. And so yeah. I don't think anybody in the legislature wants the headline issue of 22 to be medical marijuana. So my, my guess is they're going to move it fairly quickly. And then if they don't uh, accede to the governor's preferences, the big question is, are they going to, will the governor veto it? And then what yeah. happens from there? And then you'll be back at the back of the drawing board. That's exactly right. Yeah, well, it'll it'll be certainly interesting to see um, what happens in that space, and and the win is certainly when it will happen. Um, I think is the big takeaway. Okay, in the last few last minute, um, anything else we should be paying attention to for twenty twenty two Mississippi legislative session? I think the big the big thing that's not getting as much play is redistricting. Yeah, uh, because of the census, they've got to redraw the congressional districts. Uh, they've already put a map out. Uh, there's already litigation about it. Uh, Mississippi's current congressional districts uh, were drawn by the courts, so we'll see whether or not that happens. And then the legislature's got to re- redraw its own districts, uh, and I don't, I don't think we'll see that map until the very end of the uh, very end of the session. But, uh, but I think that'll also be a major part of uh, what happens this year. Yeah, and that is always a source of heated debate um, and intense scrutiny. So um, we'll be looking forward to that. Well, Lucian, thank you so much for coming in today. Absolutely, Mandy. It's great to see you. Yeah, you too. Happy New Year. You too. All right. For our listeners out there, stay tuned.